there. Welcome to another edition of Meet the Press Reports, our magazine show where we take a deep dive into a single topic or event. So this week, it's more of an event. Uh, we're going to showcase some of the outstanding films and filmmakers from this year's Meet the Press Film Festival. These are the best-in-class short documentaries, and they're covering the most consequential issues of our time. In fact, in the last five years, the Meet the Press Film Festival has showcased more than 100 films from nine countries. Dozens of these films in our festival have gone on to be nominated for Emmys and Oscars, and we're particularly proud of the winner of the 2020 Academy Award for Short Documentary as well. This year, we have some of the best films we've ever been privileged to showcase. They tackle the biggest issues of the last 18 months, from democracy and COVID to prison reform and racial violence. And in fact, that's where we'll start. I spoke with Christine Turner, the director of Lynching Postcards, Token of a Great Day, and Don Porter, director of Breway, Promise, Witness, Remembrance. Let's take a look at a clip from each of these films, and then you'll hear from the filmmakers right after. A postcard is an extension of our experience. A postcard allows us to continue to relive that experience. It also allows us to disseminate that experience. People use social media today to show other people what they are doing in their everyday life. Look what I draw pleasure from. Lynching postcards were used in the same way. You get down here to the portrait and it's breathtaking and it's, you just stand there and most of the time you just, people are just standing there staring at it. It's not even a lot to have to say about it. Just the beauty in it, the, the way she captured Brianna. have it end up in a museum and, and it's going to be a part of history at this point. Like so many people, I had seen, uh, you know, so many reports about her death and we really wanted to give her life some agency. And, you know, all of this, this uh, footage of her was there for the asking. And uh, I, I also felt like this was... Um, this is what her mother wanted. This is what any parent would want is to um, have a sense of the life of the person that was unnecessarily cut short. So that was really intentional. And thank you for noticing that. Don, it was what actually made, the, I mean, that's all I know. My wife and I were like, my God, if there's if the, all this artwork just for Brianna's mom uh, has got to be so, uh, so helpful in getting through this process. But what, what, what I thought was interesting also was how, um, how, how, much, how inspiring Brianna Taylor was to other artists. And it is a reminder that our best art, whether it's music, filmmaking, uh, photography, and we're about to get to photography in a minute, sometimes comes from pain. You know, one of the, the lines that stays with me from her mother is she says, everyone can't protest. Um, yeah. And so one of the spontaneous things that happened in the wake of her death was people started uh, sending art to her mother, started sending portraits as if they wanted to let her mother know that uh, she was alive for them, that she would be remembered. And, and then her mother took that art and created that beautiful room. And instead of it being something painful, it's something that gives her great peace um, and so then you see that kind of, you know, on steroids when Amy Sherald paints her portrait, which now hangs in our nation's museum. It is a national reminder, not yeah. only of her tragic death, but also of her life and of the promise of her life. Look, art at its best is supposed to do that. It's supposed to invoke a lot of passion, a lot of emotions like this. Christine, I want to turn to, to lynching postcards. You know, it was, it was and the First of all, I want to talk, talk about finding all of these. Where did you find them? I, I just found this to be so important because to me it was evidence. In the same way, why is videotaping what happens? Why is the cell phone so important to letting people know why, why, why we say Black Lives Matter, why this is an issue? These postcards were the social media of those days. How did you get them all? Absolutely. And they very much um, were evidence. Um, a great number of the postcards came from the Allen Littlefield collection, um, which is housed at the Atlanta Center for Civil and Human Rights. And um, 
uh, James Allen was a collector of antiques and souvenirs, and he came across um, a lynching postcard. This is decades ago now, um, and took an interest in collecting them. Um, several others of them came from the Smithsonian um, and just really a host and array of different universities and archives. So it was a process very much um, to collect all of this material. Um, it took a long time, um, but it's obviously essential in telling the film. And, you know, you talk about evidence. And one of the things that, you know, I just think about is like, how much more evidence do we really need? Um, right. We've all seen these images before. We are inundated with um, this video. And I, and I do wonder, you know, how much more we really actually need to see. I know, but imagine if we didn't have the evidence of these postcards, imagine the rewriting. We already know, look at the attempts. I mean, we're, look at all the memorials we're trying to get taken down the rewriting of history, the whitewashing of history. And imagine if we didn't have these photographs, let me ask you this, um, about it. Um, Christine, which was the, this transition, the fact that those that participated in these lynchings were eager to be photographed until a point where they realized they didn't want to be eager to be photographed. It's just such an interesting like pivot point that, I, that, that we hit in the teens, right? This is when you discover this, when people realize, wait a minute, we don't want photographic evidence. Yeah, I mean, I think that they were a point of pride. These lynchings, they were celebrations. They were, it was a leisure activity and people were proud to be associated with them. It was um, a way to, in some cases, show their standing in the community. You know, the film talks about the closer you were to the body, the more it said about your position um, in a particular community. I think when um, increasingly the NAACP and other anti-lynching activists began subverting these photographs and began subverting these postcards and using them for their own purposes and recontextualizing them. But then suddenly mm -hmm. people realized, oh, I am becoming part of the evidence. But the reason that they could stand there and be in these photographs um, was, was because they knew that they wouldn't be prosecuted, you know? And so I think that as we start to see that change, there becomes more shame associated with it. And of course, people don't want to, um, you know, stand right in front. Don, do you have a, do you have a good explanation why I mean, it does feel like both George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, I mean, some of the most iconic images of both of them are artwork. I think of the murals uh, that we've seen, not just in Minnesota, but frankly, I think in Texas as well. And of course, what you showcased here, but there are, you know, you go to a lot of communities around the country and you'll see a mural of Breonna Taylor, you know, just uh, on the side of a building. It is astounding um, the the depth of emotion that her death, that George Floyd's death provoked. There are there is a statue of Breonna in New York City, a bronze statue next to John Lewis. I mean, that's how iconic and symbolic her image is. And I think that um, one of the things, you know, I made a film about John Lewis, and one of the things he was able to see the film, but also to see the protest in response to George Floyd's killing. And one of the things he said is in all 50 states, in so many countries around the world, people are having the same response, which is this cannot be forgotten. This cannot be obliterated. We must deal with our racial reckoning. And I think that um, the art is uh, forever. She will literally right. never be forgotten because the artist will not let her be forgotten. And Christine, in many ways, what you're trying to surface up with all of these photos is we can't forget this, the painful part either. And that's your, your visuals are the painful. I think, as Don put it, your visuals are the painful visuals of our history that you may want to look away, but you we shouldn't let people. Exactly. And I think they're necessary. Right. And understand, we have to understand our history in, in, under, in order to understand the current moment. And so um, as much as we don't want to confront these images and that we do shy away, um, I think it's really important that we see them and that people are aware of them. Don Porter, Christine Turner, thank you both. Congratulations to both of you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So in a time where we're debating how to teach history, there are still many stories of representation that are almost forgotten. Next up, this is a story about an artist who set the stage for Norman Rockwell, but who was later erased from history. Encoded, the hidden love of J.C. Leyendecker, filmmaker Ryan White tells the story of a man who found a way to share his identity with those who knew how to look. Here's a clip from the film, plus my conversation with the director. 
This was so criminalized. We had to keep a low profile and use coded language to express ourselves safely. And we've seen it within art and advertising, like in the imagery of this gay artist, J.C. Leindecker, who was working in the early 1900s. He was able to thread in queerness in an era when it's not accepted. Art history aficionado. This is my first uh, film about the arts world, but yeah, I think most Americans have have uh, grown up learning about Norman Rockwell, and I see. I think for most uh, Americans, J. C. Lyon Decker may ring a bell, but definitely um, most people don't know who he is. And I think that was the the purpose of making this film was to uh, bring his legacy. Um, in both the advertising world and also queer history back to the forefront. Uh, how did he come to your attention? How did this uh, story come to your attention and what drew you to deciding, you know what, I want to make, make a film about this? So in the archives of Procter & Gamble, an archivist was looking through um, old advertisements. I'm talking from uh, over 100 years ago. And a lot of these ads for Gillette and Ivory Soap were... Uh, for lack of a better term, very seemingly gay, very <laughs> homoerotic, very sexual in nature. Um, and it kind of blew their mind that ads like these may have existed, you know, a century ago um, in magazines and newspapers. And those ads had all been um, drawn and illustrated by J.C. Leindecker. So that was sort of the genesis of the project. And it was brought to me saying, um, you know, would you like to look into this man's past? It's virtually been buried um, in many ways, which we explore in the film by his own doing before he died. Um, but would you be interested in um, trying to tell his story in a documentary format? I'm not traditionally a historical filmmaker. This yeah. is my first film um, made so far in the past, but I thought it, it was an exciting opportunity, especially for a short documentary to try to bring uh, J.C. Lyon Decker back to life. I'll tell you what really hit me, and it goes back, and I, and I told you at the beginning, uh, I remember looking at this obituary of an aunt of mine, and I remember deciding to read this obituary. She died in 1958, before I was born, but something my father had said. And I read the obituary, and I realized that she, it, it noted in the obituary, in a small-town paper, I believe it was the Waterloo Courier in Waterloo, Iowa, and it said that she shared a home with, and named the woman, um, they had been teachers together, but it was implied that they were simply spinster roommates. And hmm. this was clearly, they had lived together 40 years. And this was, she, like I said, she died in the 50s. And, you know, I pointed it out to my dad's sister. I said, hey, did you ever really read this obituary? And when you read it through today's eyes, it's tragic. It's sad. And you realize, my gosh, they hid her life even in death. I was definitely, when I was growing up in the 80s, there was never any queer history and mm -hmm. Schools. And so I think that's um, sort of the value in telling stories like this, especially of queer people from those older generations that that didn't have the freedom to live out and proud. And J.C. Leyendecker probably had that freedom more so than anyone. And even his legacy has been buried. So I can't imagine um, for people like your aunt, everyday people um, who were trying to live their queer lives, um, how, how difficult that was. So you know, hopefully this story is a, is a conversation starter in that type of way, like you're talking about where families talk about the people from their past um, who may have had to hide their, 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 their relationship. I think another part of this that, that, to me, you hint at by the way you ended the film is how much history, how much uh, queer history is gone that we know exists, but people literally, you know, for fear, for whatever reason, as we were discussing earlier... Is it their family members feared public, uh, you know, knowing these things in public for whatever reason, but that they, they destroyed their, their life's work, not just sort of hiding who they were. Um, do you hope this unearths more history that maybe is buried in attics like you, uh, like you ended up finding with, uh, with uh, Leindecker? Yeah, and we're very, very lucky that any of his artwork persisted, you know, at the 
at the end of the film, he did ask his lifetime partner, his, his, his husband, for lack of a better phrase, uh, to burn everything. And luckily, some stuff didn't get burned. And that's the only reason we have right. uh, the incredible artistic legacy that we do. So yeah, I hope I hope this is a, a this film is one of many that looks back at queer people from those from those generations and as a part of, you know, retelling those stories, whether it's in documentary format or written format, whatever that may be. Look, uh, you have to make choices as a filmmaker. Uh, the decision to do the animation. Uh, I, I take it you had, a, you had a challenge, which was you wanted, you needed some narrative and you couldn't interview Decker because he's not here. So why animation? Yeah, we were lucky in the fact that there was enough of a written record of J.C. Leyendecker from diaries, from letters, from articles at the time that we were able to sort of piece together this narrative of the life he had lived, but there were very few visuals minus his artwork. So we used the style of his artwork, which is totally unique, you know, mm -hmm. which should be a whole film unto itself, the style differences between J.C. Leyendecker and Norman Rockwell. Uh, but we used that style uh, to animate J.C. Leyendecker's uh, life and bring it to life. And we were very lucky that uh, Neil Patrick Harris uh, plays J.C. Leyendecker in the film. So we had an actor of his caliber bringing his real yeah. words to life. But, um, you know, the visuals were only in our imaginations. And so uh, our animation director, Danny Madden, did a beautiful job of UC using J.C. Leyendecker's artwork um, to bring his own life uh, to, to, to imagery. Well, look, congratulations, because it really worked. It didn't feel, it didn't feel manufactured. I mean, obviously, it was a creative decision, but sometimes those things feel like they're disjointed, and that didn't at all. Um, it's a terrific film, and what I, I just... It's my favorite thing about this film festival is when you just find out things you didn't know and wish you did. So congratulations, Ryan. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you for having me. When we come back, what happens when the immigration fight, prison reform, and COVID all take root in one building? My conversations with the directors behind the Meet the Press Film Festival continue right after this break. We are back. As COVID-19 swept across the country in 2020, one of the most vulnerable populations were those people who ended up locked up, whether in prison or a detention facility. In the facility from Seth Fried Wessler, he goes inside a private prison where Immigration and Customs Enforcement detain people with little due process at a time when social distancing became the only tool, we had no vaccines yet, that most people could use to protect themselves from the virus. And in the interview, Jonathan Miller and Zach Russo hear from former prisoners who were denied parole years and years and years after they became eligible for release. Here's some select clips from the films, followed by my interview with the filmmakers. Everybody is here under a lot of stress. We see what's happening outside, how fast it's been moving. Once it gets in here, we all feel risk. Estamos en un lugar donde no depende de nosotros la seguridad, sino de terceras personas. Y esas terceras personas no mienten. El Departamento de Inmigración y Aduana de Estados Unidos nos respondió asegurando que ICE toma amplias precauciones para limitar la propagación potencial. You're being asked to. Um relive a moment that you probably struggled with for a very long time. Being frank, I was, like, scared. Uh, I figured it would be hostile. You sit down and, you know, think about, you know, what could you say? What would you say? My worst period of my life would not forever define me. At the beginning of the pandemic, you know, my plans for reporting were sort of upended, right? I had plans to go report stories for magazines that I write for. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to continue as a print reporter um, as this pandemic was spreading to develop new stories to cover the pandemic on the beats that I already work on. And so I began making a series of calls through a video app that's installed inside of a set of ICE detention centers that allow people on the outside to call into people on the inside to have short conversations 15 minutes at a time um, using these pay-per-minute video apps. They're, they're really made for family members, people mm -hmm. on the outside, to call relatives on the inside so that they can maintain contact. They're pretty expensive, but as a reporter, I decided it was worth it to pay per minute 
to get this access to try to figure out what was happening inside of ICE detention centers as the pandemic was really turning the world upside down. It allowed you in some ways to at least briefly take us into the facility, which I think made made your stand out. You know, John, yours uh, was about, and in many ways, trying to get at what does it, you know, what does it take to get past a parole board? And I will tell you, the, I, I found this, I found all of your subjects very interesting. I wish I could have seen the interview with the parole board. I'm sure you wish you could have, too. What were some of the restrictions that you faced? Um, well, in New York State, parole hearings aren't uh, public, so right. we sort of knew from the, from the get-go that that access wasn't going to be possible. And I, I think what we were trying to do with the film was really to show what this experience was like for them. And so what we were trying to, what we, we ended up deciding to do is, you know, uh, doing these sort of expansive interviews that um, felt visually and story-wise like it might have, you know, or for the audience, like it might have looked as if you were, you know, experiencing a parole hearing along with them. But mm -hmm. unlike a parole hearing, our interviews would hopefully be, you know, much more humanizing right. um, long, and not just, you know, focusing on on the crime and sort of holding up a mirror to the process and, and thinking about like what it was like for them to go through this and you know to have like 10 minutes to you know convince three strangers that they're more than the worst thing they ever did what your two films do have in common and i and i i look forward to both of you seeing the other's film is you essentially expose a black box meaning you're like so whether it's ha, ha, why was someone detained and what does it take to get out of detention uh, it, it, it is it clear even at the end when when Andrea and Nilsson do get released, they don't know why they were released, which means they don't know why they were detained. Uh, and yours, Seth, and and of course, it you know why did why did some of these folks finally get paroled now, but not five years earlier, two years earlier, four years earlier? And I'll be honest with you, I still am not sure. So, Seth, let me begin with you. Um, let's take Nilsson. Um, he doesn't know why he was held for as long as he was held, and he's not quite sure how he was released, or at least as far as the film is concerned. Can you fill in some of the blanks? I mean, ICE detention, immigration detention, and just to fill in some background here, you know, it's civil detention. It's not prison. It's not meant as punishment, at least as a legal matter. It's a thing that exists to hold non-citizens who are facing the threat of deportation ostensibly so that they don't abscond, so that they show up in court. It's at the discretion of the federal government, of right. ICE. And so nearly everybody who's detained in ICE detention could actually be released at any point at the discretion of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And policy shifts dramatically from administration to administration about who's detained, who's prioritized, who's held in detention, who's released and let to stay at home with their families. Nielsen and Andrea, the people in my film, really had no idea when they would be released. They were detained pursuant to policy at the time under the Trump right. administration that nearly anybody who could be detained would be detained. So Nielsen had been pulled over for a driving violation and was locked up um, in ICE detention after an arrest following the driving violation. Andrea had come to Los Angeles from Colombia by plane with a tourist visa, right. um, intended to enter the country, but when officials at the airport asked her if she feared returning to her country, she was detained and treated as an arriving, as an arriving asylum seeker. And under the Trump administration, arriving asylum seekers were summarily detained. Right. She was held for nearly two years without any idea when she would be released. But Seth, both are still here, right? Both are now in America. Both are still in America. They weren't, they weren't sent away out of country, That's correct? right. So they were Andrea just held. Is, they were held for months and then let, let, allowed to stay, period. That's right. I mean, Andrea's in court proceeding through her right. asylum case. Nielsen is waiting for a green card. He's married to a, a U.S. citizen. He has very clear claims right. to be able to stay here. He probably was never going to be deported, actually. He right. was probably going to win his case, 
But because ICE had the discretion to hold him at the time, they had a sort of policy, as a policy matter, were holding anybody that they could. And so he stayed in detention for close to a year, actually, while he was fighting his case. And through this film, the facility, I really tried to bring people inside because for most of the pandemic, uh, for the beginning of the pandemic, the early months of the pandemic, right. I sort of attached myself to this computer screen in order to have these conversations with people and to observe what life was like inside of an ICE facility that's really built with the intention to separate people from the outside world. Right. Absolutely. Well, look, the other two things these two films have in common is these are topics that the, uh, the public uh, tries to look away from sometimes uh, and shouldn't look away. This is all part of our system, all part of our system of weather, and if we don't like it, um, we should do something about it. And sometimes you've got to see something that's a bit uncomfortable in order to make change. Uh, Seth and John, both of your films, I think, do that. Congratulations to both of you. I appreciate you uh, participating in our film festival. Thanks. Thanks so much for having us. And thank you to all of the filmmakers in this year's Meet the Press Film Festival. For our viewers that are watching live on NBC News now, tickets are available for virtual screenings until November 14th of 2021. Just go to fest.afi.com. That's all we have for this episode of Meet the Press Reports. Thanks for being here. Uh, here. We drop new episodes each week, and you can see the full library of Meet the Press Reports episodes anytime you want on Peacock. I'll see you on Sunday on Meet the Press. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.